So I have the great pleasure um, to introduce our second keynote speaker for today. Um, Dr. Denise Atkins is an associate professor um, at the University of Missouri's School of Information Science and Learning Technologies. Uh, while there, she has focused uh, much of her research, writing, and service on diversity issues, specifically related to Latino communities and underserved populations. Um, in addition to her work um, as an associate professor at Missouri, Dr. Atkins received a Fulbright Scholars Award in 2008 um, to study library education in Honduras. Um, she is also a member of many national and state organizations, including ELISE and ALA. Additionally, Dr. Atkins has just finished her term as um, president of Reforma, the National Association to Promote Library and Information Services to Latinos and the Spanish Speaking, um, of which she has been involved for over a decade. Um, so we are excited to have her here today um, to speak about the ways in which uh, librarians learn about diversity through education, research, professional associations, and various other means. So please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Denise Atkins. Wow, I am confused and frightened that you learned so much about me when I know I didn't give you that much introduction. <laughs> diversity and the roles of LIS education, LIS associations, and lived experience in learning about diversity. Um, I am actually representing a research team of three, myself and two master's students at my university, Christina Bearden, who is an attorney who has tired of being an attorney and now is becoming a law librarian, and Charles Year, who is an international student from Uganda who has come to earn his degree, and then he intends to go home and do good things. Okay, so learning about diversity, the role of LIS education. Many people have been here before me. Some of them are in the room right now. Some of them are at other conferences right now. Um, so it's a common question to ask, what are library schools, or LIS schools, or I schools, if you will, doing about fill in the blank here? because we are here making a profession and in two years it's our responsibility to shape you for everything for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, um, it's a little less common for us to ask, what is the ALA doing about fill in the blank here? Or what is somebody else doing about fill in the blank here? And on a subject like diversity, we really ought to be asking what's our lived experience? So. My very first thing that I am going to tell you about is I'm going to invite you to the 5th Reforma National Conference in San Diego. It will be March 31st through April 4th instead of the dates that we had originally reserved because those dates conflicted with ACRL. So <coughs> save those dates and you are all welcome if you come um, tell them i sent you um, if you see me see if you can get something out of i might be buying drinks you never know okay the second thing i just put this in because sam had so many jokes and she was so amusing so i'm like oh wow i don't i can't really joke about diversity it's a serious topic but Fortunately, somebody else posted this on one of those feeds, and it is the academic whatever version of Jeopardy, with three, as you can see, pretty white kids, and the entire column of African American history untouched. <laughs> so that's my joke for this opening session, and so this has lightened the mood, made everyone happy. Let's move on to some depressing stuff. Oh. Okay, well actually this is not as depressing as it could be. How do librarians learn about diversity? There are a lot of ways that librarians learn about diversity, but as you can see from way down at the bottom of the screen, life experience is the biggest way. We had, for this survey, about 396 people and I'd say about, well, 
I wouldn't say, I would look at the slide and say 352 of them said they learned from life experience. Work experience was the second major follow-up, followed by news media and popular media, and then we get into associations and graduate degree programs. Now this is bad news in one sense because graduate degree programs really are not very influential. But then you think, we spent two years of our lives in them. So if you're thinking two years of your life in graduate school as compared to however many years of your life with life experience, we can see that graduate schools are making a pretty important impact given their duration. We also see, and I keep pointing at this screen, but I realize that pointing at this screen doesn't do you any good. Um, we also see that library associations are another big contender for how people learn about diversity when they're out of the field or when they are, when they are no longer studying. Now, I have about three different sources of notes here, so occasionally you'll see me look very flustered. And I'm also going to start a timer because I have a feeling Paul will have to drag me off with a little shepherd's crook, just <laughs> like on the gong show. Okay. So, a question that was asked by people you might know was what type of diversity is my insertion, because they didn't say that. If they had, it would have been great. What type of diversity training should be provided to future librarians? And this is where, in some cases, my team came in, because they have background and experience that I don't have. So Christina, the lawyer, who doesn't want to be a lawyer anymore, her partner is a counseling psychologist. And she said, well, this is interesting. I notice in LIS curriculum, there's no real curriculum for diversity. Although now, of course, that's being changed, thanks to Fiona and the other person who's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, OK. Whereas her partner, a counseling psychologist, has a very detailed list of things that they have to do, um, from internships to coursework and other things like that. Now, Charles, on the other hand, said, well, we don't really learn about diversity, but we see it every day in, and then he talked about tribal rivalries and warfare and things that I thought didn't really go on, but this is an opportunity where he raised my awareness. Oh, there was meant to be a year there. It was 2012, I believe. Okay. So when I said, I'm not the first to tread on these grounds, Lori Mestre also did a really interesting paper, and I like this paper because I'm a very visual person and I love anything that has graphs. So she surveyed ARL librarians and asked them exclusive, asked, she surveyed ARL librarians who were in multicultural librarianship positions, a very special type of position. And one of the questions she asked was, do you feel your library school prepared you for working with multiple cultures? And the yes column wasn't nearly as high as we would like to see, but the somewhat column was there. And that's kind of inspirational because, as I said before, we're only in library school two years maybe, maybe four if you go part-time. We can't prepare you for everything. But if we can prepare you partially, that's good. Now the other figure that's really interesting, and I keep looking at the figures, I should be looking up here, is the one that said that's comparing what the students thought to what faculty thought, or actually what deans thought. Mm -hmm. So the students say, the question was, did your library school offer a specific course? The students overwhelmingly said, like, no, of course not. Whereas the faculty are saying, yes, yes we did. 75% of us say we do. Where were you? <laughs> this harkens back to an issue that we have talked about today. Um, names, names would have been good. Somebody talked about it, about, it was Fiona, that's right, I did write your name down for a reason, about integrating diversity into the curriculum. About a year ago, 
I was talking to some graduate students from a library school program or an LIS program, not my own, and I asked, so what are you learning about diversity? There was a long pause. And then they said, well, I think we've learned some stuff about globalism and how important it is to cater to a global culture. And I said, oh, well, that's very interesting. Thank you. And I was shocked because I knew this program. I know this program, and they have done a lot to get diversity into the curriculum. So this is where I think if, if students aren't told that they're learning about diversity, they may not realize it. <laughs> um, this, this is one of those findings that is just amazingly like, negative. Students need to know what they're learning. And you can't count on them to pick it up. This was something I also found with this program, or with this research project. Apparently, when you're a master's student and you've just come from having no research methods course at all, you don't automatically know how to do research. Go figure. Okay, but nonetheless, I'm not going to talk about our method terribly much because there's a limited amount of time, but we asked, uh, we sent a survey around to people all over the country and asked, did you take courses in your LIS program that focused on diversity or included diversity components? This is different from Mestre's question because she asked specifically about multiculturalism. We talked about diversity and we also included including diversity components. And so a good number, maybe a third, a little bit more than a third, said yes, yes they did. And a lot said no. So students want it and they don't see it. One of the quotes that we have here that was very powerful is, it's embarrassing how little we discuss diversity in our curriculum at the high school. I'm guessing that was not from a student here. In fact, it may have been from a student at my program. I don't know. And other people said, I wish my program had more coursework. They appreciate it. Those who did say, yes, I did, frequently actually named the course the instructor or the school, and one of them, the happy quote that I like to see, it was the most engaging and thought-provoking course in my LIS program. So students appreciate learning about diversity. We don't need to be afraid to teach them. We just need to tell them that we're teaching diversity. Because if they don't take a course labeled diversity, they think, well, I'm not learning about diversity. And according to a study, employers want it. So that means that this is a valuable skill. People need to know how to work with the multicultural populations that, as Sam pointed out early, early this morning, a long, long time ago, we are going to be seeing quite soon if we're not already seeing them now. And here's the hopeful and inspirational message. So this is the part where I want us all to feel really good. <coughs> Just going by me, I can see a change looking at time, or looking at people's comments. People were saying, no, I earned my degree in 1970. There was no diversity then, well, there was. I remember, I, I wasn't there, but you know, I've read the history. We were, we were really trying to emphasize getting ALA <coughs> and the organization to see, hey, we come in many colors, we come in many types. 1973, huh? They didn't even have diversity as a topic back then. 80s, eh, not much dis discussion of diversity. Should have been. Uh, fall 1991, eh, no, wasn't discussed. Early 1990s, oh, it was just beginning. We were looking at texts other than old white guys. Well, as, as a matter of fact, in the early 1990s, there were a lot of texts written by people other than old white guys. I know, because I was in library school then. And I was reading those. And then, finally, it's been over 10 years, so we're putting this at late 90s, early 2000s, but yes, I did take courses related to learning about Native American Hispanic library users, so I'm going to guess, even though this is unethical, this is probably a knowledge-driven person who was saying this, but look, we're seeing this time progression. People say, no, no, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, and then yes, yes, of course it did. So, well, let's see, there was... 
There was a note I was going to make about that. Ah, so I was going to reflect that. This is a trick I learned from Cornelia when we had dinner with her, no, when she attended our student-run research conference <coughs> last week, two weeks ago, is the keynote is supposed to summarize up what everybody else has been saying. So I was doing that, but I didn't write down any names. So um, when our representative from the Museum of the American Indian was speaking, uh, it might be called something different now, but he kept saying M-A-I or M-I-A, um, he was saying, you know, and we're really seeing that the Society of American Archivists is having a, they were stuck. They didn't want to move forward with protecting indigenous populations' rights, but we'll be <coughs> interested to see where they are next time. So this is your inspirational message. Next time, things could change. It could be different. Okay. So we're in library school only a short time, but Hopefully, we're in our associations for a long time. Um, I know I've been in ALA for a long, long time. Now, I haven't been a continuous member for all my years. I, I stood out uh, in protest a couple of years. But how do LIS associations contribute to librarians' diversity knowledge? Well, the ALA has a very broad definition of diversity. They are looking at Let's see, now I need to look at this screen to read, but looking at this screen to point. Okay, so they're looking at isolation, economics, language literacy, race, discrimination, um, for a variety of reasons, including, well, including just about everything, religious background, sexual orientation, and barriers to equal education, employment, and housing. So these are important things. This includes a lot of people. And we know from looking at ALA that diversity and equitable access are key action areas. This means ALA should be doing a lot. Well, ALA is doing a lot. ALA is not publicizing what it's doing as well as it should be. We know about Spectrum. Um, what else do we know about? Okay, there's Spectrum. Spectrum has a good leadership institute. Okay, this, I, am, I am literally stumped here because I'm presenting and so I have no more brain power. Librarians of Color Conference? Yes, thank you, thank you. Denise? So, okay, two things. So do you want me to chime in at this point? Michelle, go ahead. Okay, so that's... I'd like to introduce the ALA Office for Diversity <coughs> Representative, Yay! Michelle Arrowwood. Yes, hi, everybody. Okay. I'm also the director of the Office for Literacy and Outreach Services. Can everybody hear me? No. Okay. Get no. the mic. Okay. 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 He's right 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 okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Great. Now I know you can hear me. So um, I joined the association in this role or in this dual role uh, a little over a year ago. So Denise is actually touching on something that I had expressed some concerned about coming in the door, which was that I knew there were things going on, but I never heard about them. So I'm just going to make a quick pitch and just say that in addition to Spectrum, um, the office does liaise with a member group, the ALA Committee on Diversity. So if you are an ALA member and you have an interest in diversity issues, please indicate that interest and that you'd like to be part of that committee. I do have some things that I have in mind to work with the committee on. There are some subcommittees or sub-working groups of the committee that are going to be working on some things. The office also has diversity research grants. So the other quick pitch is uh, the applications for those are being accepted through the end of this month. And those are a $2,500 award for original research in LIS diversity. If you want more details about that, I'm sitting back here. I'll be here all day. You can come back and talk to me about it. I don't want to take too much time away from Denise's presentation, but I did want to make mention of those couple of things. Thank goodness you were here. Yay. Okay, so I knew the ALA was doing some things, and the divisions and the various other bodies are doing some things. When I spoke to Courtney Young, when she was our visitor, I looked her straight in the eye and I said, so, I thought things were happening, and yet, I went to a reforma meeting and 
It was at midwinter. We had the two candidates for president, the two current candidates for president speaking. And they left the room, and a reformista said to, raised her hand and said, so we hear these things all the time, but we never really see any action. And so I said, so Courtney, uh, we hear these things all the time, but we never really see any action. I said it like it, they were my words. And Courtney said, yes, I know. And I think a lot of that is because we don't, I can't remember her exact phrasing, so this is a paraphrase now. We don't reflect back. We don't re-honor the work we do. So, and of course, I also asked about diversity fatigue, because some people, and there was one, maybe two respondents in our pool who showed signs of diversity fatigue by the fact that their answers were slightly sarcastic and yeah, kind of funny, but yeah. kind of kind of like, um, well, that wasn't really the point. So diversity fatigue, in my opinion, I haven't done research on this, is caused by the feeling that it's an endless well. It's kind of like compassion fatigue that public library or public facing librarians deal with. There is so much need out there, and we do as much as we can, and there's still more need. If we could see many of the successes that are going on, many of the things where, holy cow, ALSC is making a project for children who need, or the Dia de los Niños, Dia de los Libros project for children of all cultures, not just Mexican children, even though it's Mexican Day of the Child that we celebrated on or around, where all children come to the library, they celebrate reading, they celebrate literacy, they bring their families. If we could see all these things that all of the divisions are doing, we would be impressed. We would say, hey, I really see that diversity is a key action area and we have done something. But we don't always hear about that. Okay, other associations, ARL and ACRL, are famous for their work on diversity-related things, using the term things very broadly, leadership and career development program. Teresa Neely addressed, or she reviewed that work and found it was wonderful. Um, Lori Mestre looked at diversity on ARL websites and found that it was not wonderful. Um, our own Mark Puente, raise your hand. Okay. Went through talking about music librarianship and looked at a whole lot of special library associations and what they are doing to encourage diversity. So there's a lot of work going on, but we don't always hear about it. <clears throat> and getting back to that subject, so what did our participants mes mention, the people who responded to our survey? They talked about Spectrum, of course, JCLC, of course, a couple of listservs, Black Caucus and Apollo. I was disappointed that nobody talked about Reforma, but I understand that we've had our ups and downs. We just barely got our listserv back, and that was a challenging time. And the recent brouhaha with the ALA Code of Conduct. So, oh, and Mid-America Library Alliance, because we did ask people in Missouri what what they, how they get their news, and of course they said Mid-America Library Alliance. However, what we did not see mentioned quite so much was ARL, ACRL. I, I still personally not seeing Reforma here stings, but maybe they assumed since I was already in Reforma they didn't need to tell me about it. <laughs> um, we didn't see Kala, we didn't see a lot of other associations that I thought we would see mentioned. Okay, and finally, finally, um, how final is this? Huh, in two minutes. I am going to talk to you about the words we use to talk about diversity. Now, we've been talking about diversity, and during a lot of our conversations, we've been hearing things like people of color, people of various sexualities or various sexual identities or sexual orientations. People of, well, we haven't heard about religions, but religion is out there. So, people that we may also know, racial diversity has received the most focus in LIS literature. It's true. 
This, in many ways, reflects our recent history. Right now, because we had the civil rights struggles of the 1960s, well, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and before that too, because of this, we actually count things now. And we count certain things. We count people of color, yes. We don't count people of religious backgrounds because that's just getting way too into my private life. We don't count people based on their sexuality, their gender identity, um, other things. We don't count people, it may be done, but it's not done at the federal level. If it's not done at the federal level, then it's not done in Missouri. And many things that aren't done at the federal level are not done in Missouri. And if it's not done in Missouri, it's probably not done in Arizona either. And those are the states that I know best. <laughs> Um, racial diversity has traditionally received the most focus because in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, that was what we were working for, equal representation. Now, now that we've gone through those challenges, we hopefully don't need to talk quite so much about, hey, everybody needs equal representation, but surprise, we still do. So, here's actually a cloud tag, some of it you can so, okay, I'm going to go real quick now. Some of it you can read, some of it you can't read. But these are, all of the responses we got, we actually assessed based on what do people talk about when they talk about diversity. <clears throat> One of our questions was, how do you define diversity? And so this is actually our, our codes that we used. Every time somebody said black, we race ethnicity. If they said Mexican, race ethnicity. If they said, um, Muslim and Christian religion, belief, faith. If they said atheist and non-atheist, we also check religion, belief, faith, figuring that atheist is atheism is an expression of religion, belief, or faith in the lack thereof. See, this is where it all gets really awkward because there are so many different kinds of people and kinds of needs that we should be keeping ourselves aware of. Anyway, this is what we found. Race and ethnicity are still the big ones. Sexuality and gender are important. That kind of reflects uh, our most recent challenges. Um, class and socioeconomic was important. And class, socioeconomic, and religion, belief, and faith. And these overshadowed ability. Now, this was where when my two students, Charles and Christina, presented this at, their, at the library conference, our ALA incoming president-elect was horrified, horrified. How can it be that we're still not thinking of ability when we think about diversity? And of course, my happy answer was, we're still not thinking about a lot of things when we think about diversity. But these are some of the things that people, sorry, does that mean? Some of the things that people talked about when they talked about diversity. Now, this is kind of a, wow, we're still into categories kind of way. But people also talked about concepts. And some of the concepts they talked about were difference, inclusion, mixture, which is kind of inclusion, representation, and I was really glad to see that some people said not just representation, but respect. And respect was something I was hoping would come out a little more strongly, but eh. And this brings me to a quote from our literature review. And what I would have liked to have done would be to somehow, with the special PowerPoint effects, block out sex, gender, and sexual orientation, because I think this quote is relevant to us no matter what. Librarians need to understand how the dominant terms of language restrict boundaries. They define what is and what isn't. And when we begin to untangle that language, we learn new ways to include patrons who are often excluded. Now this was directly, oh, oh, I have a typo. Oh, nobody noticed that, please. <laughs> this was directly in reference to the Canadian Library Association's statement on LGBTQ people and 
their kind of glossing over of the T in the LGBTQ. So they talk a lot about sexual orientation. They didn't talk about gender identity, and when they did, it was conflated in there. But I think this quote actually applies to a lot more of the stuff that we need to be thinking about in terms of what does diversity mean? And of course, Paul will be sitting back there in the back of the room with his arms crossed and saying, didn't you, Denise, said, well, I'm very concerned, Paul, because your definition of diversity is very broad. And what are you doing to make sure we have equal representation? And he had a nice, soft answer. His answer was something along the lines of, in creating an inclusive environment, we've found that people are more comfortable here. So our enrollment of people of color has actually increased. Our enrollment of people with disabilities has increased. And that, I'm paraphrasing him too, that is because we're creating an atmosphere where everyone is welcome. He didn't say it in those words. He said it much better than I did. And so this is a nice, happy place to end this because this is one of the responses that we got from one of our interviewees saying, and it's, I won't read it, but it's just beautiful. You can read it yourselves. And I think this goes to show that although we began our struggle toward diversity by saying, hey, I'm here, count me, make sure I am represented. As we go further, we will be able to look beyond that and say, hey, we are here. You don't need to count us because you've already included us. This is my pie in the sky dream. It's going to take many, many years, probably decades, maybe centuries, I don't know, of struggle to get us there. But I think we're seeing a lot of change. So that's the happy message. The sad message is it's going to be a lot of work still. All right, does anybody have any questions? Start back here. Hi, I'm Vivian Yoko, a doctoral student at the University of South Carolina. Lori, I really appreciate your comments today uh, because I've been stewing about this all day and you've given me an opening to ask. To me, it's about accepting and respecting not differences but individuality. The problem is, as soon as we start talking about that, do you think that there could be a problem that that takes away? from the need to focus on how people are different. Do you know what I'm getting at? It's as if we're diluting it at the same time that we're trying to confront mm -hmm. the whole problem of diversity. You know, I was, I've been back here blogging, and not blogging, but journaling as we've been talking, and my mind keeps coming back to that. It is about language, and yet somehow you just go around in circles. It's like, how do you eat an elephant? Well, where do you, where do you start? You start with the ear. <laughs> some would say you start with, I don't know, some other bit, but start with one part. And so this is where I think that a lot of the past struggle we've gone through, um, Brown versus Board of Education, Lao versus California, these are things we had to go through. And I don't want to say it had to be difficult, but we had to actually show ourselves willing to fight. And this is another thing where time will change everything, I believe. You could prove me wrong, and hopefully, hopefully when you do, I'll be dead because I'll just be so disappointed. Uh, but I think as we get more used to seeing, hey, you are a person like me. You're a person different from me. We are both people. We are both worthy of respect. As we get back to the message of, I point to the screen, civility. Then we start working with each other and not working against each other and also not working, not working on each other. Ooh. Ooh. You should, you should write that down in your journal. That's very good. <laughs> and race right, in the right there. <laughs> I'm a little
little slower in this part of the day. Hello, Professor Vargas Pollock, Eaton Not Track, Free Library in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a graduate of University of Denver at the MLIS department. And um, I, you know, I had to ask for a multiculturalism class, a class in diversity, in my year because there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. And not because I felt like I necessarily, I, I mean, not that I can't learn anything new, but I was in classes with people who had never experienced anything outside of their world. Right. And I was tired of having words like urban children, which I knew they meant brown and black children, and when, you know, and having them talk about just all these different things. What I want is for us to have spaces where it's safe to talk about the differences, safe to talk about that I don't understand the other safe to, for people to be able to, safe spaces because difference of thought, diversity of thought, which to me is so amazing because each school and each library school has their own school of thought. And when you are different than that thought, you know, I, um, University of Denver has an amazing diversity um, program. And yet, and it's considered very liberal. And so when you have somebody who's in that program, somebody who was very different than myself, who was a libertarian, and she felt very uncomfortable, and didn't feel like she could speak in class because she was so afraid about what others would say about her. You know, that's a problem. So when we talk about diversity, let's remember we have that diversity of thought. B, when you talk about respect, it, it is about respect. It's about respecting each other's ideas. But what I also learned was, I, I loved, um, Fiona and Eric's presentation about including diversity within the curriculum, because I'm going to tell you, if the word diversity is a scary term for many, and if you make it a choice, it's not going to be taken. So if we put it in the curriculum, and we put examples of it in the curriculum, of, of all these diversity things, then people can go, ah, I understand, or now I know, or not afraid to say, I don't know. We're so, we think as librarians we have to know everything. We think we have to know everything. And we have to be able to cite it. And we have to be able to find it. And you know, whatever it is. And because we all about findability. But the thing about it is, it has to be okay to say, I don't know. It has to be okay to say, I'm scared. It's okay to say that, you know what? I don't want to go to that library because I'm afraid that I don't know how to deal with those people in the classroom that should be a safe space for diversity of thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, I think we have time for... Okay, well, I just want to address real quick, that's an excellent point, and I think that's why civility has to be one of our platforms that we work toward is was it you, Sam? I, I'm going to attribute everything that happened today to you because. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. Right. 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 Oh, the lady from Howard County who said, I want to be able to go places and say, I don't know what's going on here. Explain it to me. And to know as you're doing that that you will make stupid mistakes and you will be offensive and people will just take you aside and say, hey, that's offensive. Don't say it like that. Or something along those lines. My name is Glenda Shirley and um, I'm talking about the diversity from a different aspect. I came from another country where I didn't even know I was black till I got here. So <laughs> diversity is a different thing. From in my country, diversity was even up. Um, I mix, I work in a white world. All my friends are white. My, my son said to me sometimes when he look at photographs, don't you know any black people? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying this because in the conversations about diversity, one of the things that I, everybody in that world, or most everybody, think that that was the past. So there is a lack of interest to support what she said. There's a lack of interest in diversity because it's a black problem, but it's, it went out with civil rights. Mm -hmm. So if you have a course like that, it has to be something, another word other than that, to bring in people because you have, a, it, it's, it's automatically thought of black 
when you talk about diversity. None of the socioeconomic things, none of the, 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 um, the issue of gays, lesbian, people from other countries, even I, I don't consider myself an African American. People from Africa do not consider themselves African Americans, and people of color from other countries do not consider themselves African Americans. So they would probably not, except maybe occasionally someone may, out of interest, join the class. But so you have to look at it in in, in a more embracing thought. That is true, and I will really quickly because I see that. I will really quickly, because I see people in the back of the room looking for bidding with their arms crossed. I will say that one of the... It was her. One of the things that I found in my class, and I come from Missouri, if, if we have a student of color, we are shocked. Or we aren't shocked, we're, we're happy. But we're generally a very white place. My students, I had eight students enroll in the diversity course because it was their work and life experience that this, what I'm seeing in library school, is not really reality. Reality has more, has more color tones, has more accents, has more, has more vibrancy. So I was lucky, but I think I was lucky in the sense that I work in the Midwest. So people in the Midwest are probably just learning about diversity and saying, wow, what a neat concept. <laughs> yeah, we, we've known about it on the fringes of the US for about our entire lives. So that is, I think, one of the things where I was, where some students we will get, and they, but I'm not saying let's not uh, also incorporate diversity into all of our classes, because we have to do that. I am saying what we have to do is tell our students, hey, you're learning about diversity now. And just one last plug for Courtney Young. She came in and spoke to a room full of white people. And she said, and she's African American, she said, so I need you all to stop thinking about diversity as race or color or language or anything. Because we've been working with diversity our whole life, our whole history. For as long as we've been working in information, we've been working with diversity of formats, we've been working with diversity of people, we've had been working with diversity of socioeconomic background, of course. And so this is just one more kind of diversity that we have to get used to and we have to learn to work with. Yeah. We can do one more question. I was very strongly hoping to be done. Uh, we can be done if you want. But let's, let's do one more quick question. Okay, my name is Roman Santillan. I work in Montgomery County Public Libraries. I also work in New York. And I taught college for many years. The, the tsunami I see right now happening is demographics in the U.S. Less and less students are going to college. You, know, you have problems of enrollment all over the country. And you mentioned already that the year 2050 will be basically a minority country in the future. So we have those two waves, you know, coming. One is going to be a majority, minority country, and you have the students. And I see right now working in a public library, most of the kids who come in Montgomery County are basically poor and more, or the parents were poor and more. So um, it's, it's here. I mean, uh, it's not. It's, it's probably more. Um, like a century ago, when the U.S. would have a big immigrant from Europe, basically, right now coming from Latin America, Asia, and Africa, this is a probably the metric pot is getting bigger. I mean, uh, so I think that's that's something that we are seeing. But at the same time, the elephant in the room is this future generation of librarians. Some of them have been training them for, for many years. Um, we had to go for black and white, Latino, Hispanic. So it's, it's more diverse. So that's, that's my concern. That's my concern as well. As you see from this slide, we are very used to thinking about black and white. Oh, well, this is a black and white issue. It's a black and Latino and white issue. It's a black, Latino, white, and Asian issue. And I think it's not. I don't think it's not. Not, it's not just I think it's not. 
we think it's not. We see many things. But I think one of the things that we probably need to concentrate on is letting other people know what their role is. So Courtney Young was talking to our, our white students, and she said, oh, you have a role in diversity too. And your role is to make sure that everyone is treated equitably. And not just that, but to make sure that when you encounter people, that you learn from them, and that you learn to respect them. So we all have a role in, I'm sorry, I just went blank. <laughs> we all have a role in diversity. And I think if we see it as just, oh, it's just their job, it's just Reforma's job, it's just Black Caucus's job, it's just Kala's job, then I don't think we will have sufficient traction within the profession to make a difference. Okay, thank you very much.